Welcome to the City Club of Eugene's October 9th, 2020 program. The City Club of Eugene and the League of Women Voters of Lane County are hosting candidate forums on House Districts 8 and 11. This is the fifth program of our 2021 programming year. My name is Scott Coltrane and I'm the City Club President. Support for the City Club is provided by our members and sponsors. You can become a member of City Club at our website, cityclubofeugene.org. We have both business and in-kind sponsors, including Diamond Sponsors. Kaiser Permanente exists to provide high quality, affordable health care services and to improve the health of our members and the communities we serve. More information at www.kp.org. Support comes from the University of Oregon. Since 1876, UO has helped Oregonians question critically, think logically, reason effectively, communicate clearly, act creatively, and live ethically. More information at uoregon.edu. Peace Health is proud to serve Eugene, Lane County, and beyond. As your hometown health care partner for more than 80 years, our mission is to keep you and your family healthy. Learn more at peacehealth.org. Lane Community College transforms lives through learning. LCC provides comprehensive, accessible, high quality educational opportunities that promote student success. For more information, visit lanecc.edu. We would also like to acknowledge the generous support from the City of Eugene and from Lane County. On to today's program. First, I would like to thank Joel Corrin and Fred Roberts for coordinating today's program. Today's speakers include the two candidates for Oregon House District 8, Timothy Aldall and Paul Holvey, and the two candidates for Oregon House District 11, Katie bossert Glazer and Marty Wildey. The program will be moderated by KLCC's Chris Lehman. Oregon House District 8 occupies a large part of West Central Lane County, anchored in southwest Eugene and including areas south to Lorraine, West Walton, and north almost to Junction City. Given the variability of the terrain, District 8 key issues range broadly from environmental protection and climate change to homelessness, affordable housing, property taxes, minimum wage, high school dropout rates, campaign finance, and state budget management. Timothy Aldall, a Republican, served on active duty in the United States Army and currently holds the rank of major in the Oregon Army National Guard, acting as an operations officer. He works in the Eugene area as the Director of Social Services in a skilled nursing facility with disabled people and vulnerable seniors. Mr. Aldall attended Lane Community College and earned a B.S. at the University of Oregon. More information on Mr. Aldall is at timothy4oregon.com and that's Timothy with the number 4, Oregon.com. Paul Holvey, a Democrat and the incumbent, has represented District 8 since 2004 and serves as Speaker Pro Tem. During his tenure in the House, he has supported legislation on solar and energy storage technology, protections for domestic violence victims, consumer protections, minimum wage increases, and field burning restrictions, and led action on environmental protections and climate change issues. In his role, Representative Holvey has also secured many infrastructure investments in our community. Before his public service career, Representative Holvey worked as a carpenter and a union official. He attended Lane Community College and the University of Oregon. More information on Mr. Holvey is at paulholvey.com. House District 11 stretches from southeast Eugene, north to Coburg, and past Harrisburg into Lynn County, almost to Corvallis then east to Lebanon, Sweet Home, Brownsville, south to the McKinsey Highway, 
and west through Pleasant Hill. Like District 8, the territory requires attention to a broad array of issues. The two candidates for House District 11 are Katie Bossert Glazer and Marty Wilde. Katie Bossert Glazer, a Republican, farms on her family's 125-year-old heritage farm in the heart of the Willamette Valley. She attended Santiam Christian High School, Lynn Benton Community College, and holds a veterinarian technician certificate and a massage license. She chose the path of trade school after high school, building a career she loved. Volunteer work has played a major role in her life. In 2019, she worked as a legislative aide. This inside look at how government really works has made Katie passionate to ensure that everyone is truly represented in this district. More information on Ms. Glazer is at katiebossardglazer.com. Marty Wilde, a Democrat and incumbent, has represented District 11 since 2019. He previously served as a Deputy District Attorney and is Executive Director of the Lane County Medical Society. He has also served for 26 years in the military, active in reserve, and is currently a colonel in the Oregon Air National Guard. He was a member of the Eugene Police Commission, the County Performance Audit Committee, and the Eugene Budget Committee. Mr. Wilde was educated at the University of Oregon, the University of Houston Law Center, and the University of Maryland. More information on Mr. Wilde is at wildefororegon.com and in that case the four is spelled F-O-R. I will now turn things over to KLCC's Chris Lehman. Chris? Hi, I'm Chris Lehman with KLCC and happy to have uh, two candidates running for Oregon House District 8 here today. Uh, we have Democrat Paul Holvey, the incumbent in this district, and Republican challenger Timothy Aldall. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both very much for joining us here. We're going to begin with opening statements, uh, two minutes uh, each from each candidate. Uh, Tim, we'll start with you. Okay. Uh, my name is Timothy Aldall, running for House District 8. Uh, I believe my work in the civilian career uh, at a skilled nursing home here in West Eugene uh, has developed the network knowledge that people of my district and the resources to obtain um, that are present. Uh, my experience with local government, nonprofit, charitable organizations uh, will prove valuable in the state legislature. Uh, just working knowledge of my base here. Uh, your representative that I would during my 23 years uh, in the Army and the Oregon Army National Guard. Uh, I will use valuable leadership experience gained from being uh, an infantry company commander both in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'll take the same care with uh, our state's resources as I did with our, uh, our most valuable resources, uh, its citizen soldiers overseas. Um, I believe my greatest accomplishments uh, in life has been bringing them home all well to their families and to be future leaders and uh, good neighbors and citizens uh, in our district. Thank you. And now Paul Holvey with his opening statement. Well, uh, first I want to thank uh, the City Club and League of Women Voters for the forum. Uh, I have been in the legislature since 2004, uh, quite a while for the most part. I'm a speaker pro tem there where I've gained a lot of respect from both sides of the aisle. And uh, I have worked over the years on a lot of different issues, uh, uh, raising the minimum wage being, being one that I'm particularly proud of and uh, a host of different environmental issues as well uh, with uh, restricting field burning and also working on a lot of uh, uh, forestry issues and forest management issues. Uh, spent a lot of time on uh, energy as well, uh, renewable energy. I've done a lot of work around solar energy and energy storage implementing programs at the state level for both of those. Uh, I still uh, we are in challenging times right now, uh, none like I've seen in my past uh, with uh, the COVID uh, pandemic upon us and then fire on top of that. And uh, 
it has really stretched us really thin. I was very proud to be put uh, as co-chair of the, the special uh, joint interim uh, committee on coronavirus response, where we had 25 different recommendations in March, uh, many of which the governor implemented through executive order. And that was a bipartisan effort. Uh, I bring a, a host of experience as well as uh, infrastructure and bonding, uh, running those committees and getting investments back into our communities, which is going to be extremely important going forward as we're stressed with our revenues, our lottery revenues, which is one of the main focuses of our bonding capacity. Uh, we will need to be able to use that bonding capacity going forward. And my experience in that arena has, has uh, led me to co-chair uh, that uh, committee, subcommittee of the Ways and Means uh, over all committee. So I, I uh, have been in the community when I was born in Eugene and uh, under, understand a lot about it. I really feel uh, proud uh, to be able to represent uh, this district in Salem and uh, appreciate uh, anybody's vote going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. We'll next uh, proceed to a series of questions. Uh, the same question I will pose to each of the two candidates, um, alternating. We'll start with uh, Paul Holvey. And uh, along the way, if either of you would like me to repeat the question, uh, please uh, say so. Otherwise, we'll just pivot from one candidate to the other as we go along. So uh, the first question, um, first to uh, Paul Holvey. We're about seven months into the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, the state legislature has already taken some actions. Uh, what going forward, given that case counts, case counts are now uh, on the uptick uh, again, what going forward can the legislature take to address this, Paul? Well, I think uh, the legislature has to continue its, its efforts uh, around public health and uh, uh, making sure people are doing safe practices uh, in our communities, whether it's wearing masks, social distancing. Uh, we need to keep track of, of this virus and keep it uh, under control. Otherwise, it will have uh, continuing negative impacts on our economy, on businesses, on our schools. And so I think first and foremost is making sure we have the resources and uh, the equipment and that the, our first responders, our healthcare workers are fully supported uh, that they can continue to respond. Uh, we, we cannot, we cannot uh, risk uh, losing that workforce, uh, whether because they're so vitally needed, uh, we we will be investing as much as we can. Uh, we're we're still hoping for more uh, funding from the federal government uh, to help state and local governments. Uh, it's a big hole that uh, we've experienced. Our budgets are under stress because uh, we we don't print money like the federal government does. We balance our budget every biennium. So it's going to be very, extremely important for us to uh, maximize those investments. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, Timothy? Uh, so moving forward, uh, it, it is good to hear uh, some support from the legislature, especially if one is uh, as seasoned as uh, Representative Holby, uh, giving support for those health care workers. Um, that is the primary focus, I, I believe, uh, seven months ago, it was to flatten that curve and um, reduce uh, the spread of this virus. Um, seven months later, a lot of our businesses have not reopened. Um, their, their inability to make ends meet, uh, even with our phased reopening, uh, it's been hit and missed at best. Um, I live in the Veneta area, but I work here in Eugene. Uh, going back and forth, the disparity within the district is is quite pronounced. Once you once you leave Eugene, uh, you go out to those those outer areas, and and businesses just haven't opened. Uh, there's just no ability for that. Uh, the healthcare workers we do have, and being a healthcare worker and working in the industry, we do have the PPE we need. Um, we are being successful in in keeping uh, people safe uh, within our our uh, structures that we have. Um, I live in or work in a nursing home uh, and we 
being, you know, 40% of the deaths nationwide uh, with this COVID-19 are, are extra vigilant, uh, wearing the mask and the face, the face shield every single day. Um, and, and we're very thankful of, of the, the delivery that did come in uh, of the PPE that came uh, directed through the National Guard uh, to augment uh, what our corporate headquarters was able to give to us. Um, that being said, it was a very small token and almost almost really wasn't a, a showing that we needed with this vast of a, a pandemic. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, jump in here and uh, remind us that we want to move along. So please try to keep responses to about uh, one minute and, and thank you. Uh, this summer, this question will go first to, to Timothy. Uh, this summer, there have been racial justice uh, protests and demonstrations throughout Oregon in big cities and in small communities. Again, the legislature met in special session earlier this year to address some um, issues relating to law enforcement. Uh, I was wondering if you agree with steps that have been taken and or uh, think there should be additional steps taken to address issues raised by racial justice protesters. Well, you know, it's, it's one of those things that as a white male, I feel very safe in our, in our uh, community walking around. Um, but I talk to friends who aren't and, you know, they raise those concerns, uh, uh, family being one of them that they don't feel safe in the environment that we live in. Uh, I believe what the uh, state legislators started to do in their special session to make steps uh, for racial justice, it's, it's a good start. Um, I, I think more needs to be done. Uh, I think we have excellent police officers on the force, uh, especially in Eugene. Um, our training for them is excellent, especially using the CAHOOTS program, uh, but there, there, there will always be room for improvement. And moving forward, uh, I think in uh, a long session of the legislature should deep dig much deeper into uh, committee and bring in uh, more law enforcement representatives uh, to further that. Thank you. Uh, um, Paul Holby. Yeah, uh, well, I, I'm happy to hear uh, uh, Mr. Aldall respond to the good steps we've taken in the legislature in special session, but he's right, there's more to be done there. We, we definitely need to have a more transparent and more accountable uh, system of law enforcement. And uh, I know we have lots of good models and lots of uh, uh, good police departments that uh, really strive to do that. Uh, but we, we really need to make sure we're diligent about uh, that transparency and accountability, uh, it's really important. And, and people have a right to protest. Uh, they certainly don't have a right to, to uh, violence and, and uh, destruction, but they do have a right to protest and we need to listen to them. Uh, they, they are bringing up points that need to be made. Uh, the, the whole issue around this is, is been going on so long. We really need to have open dialogue, communication, communication, communication. We need to listen to people about what their needs are. And, uh, uh, you know, the CAHOOTS model is, is off, obviously a great model. We need better investments in response in mental health. Uh, you know, that's really key. Instead of sending the police out to a mental health crisis, we should be spending, sending uh, mental health experts to help diffuse uh, those scenarios to try to keep the the tensions down amongst uh, going to jail or, you know, just getting help. And so I think uh, those sorts of investments would really be helpful. Thank you. Uh, the next question will go first to uh, Paul. Uh, and I'll start by saying that House District 8 uh, includes some uh, urban areas and some rural areas and in, in many ways is very uh, representative of the state of Oregon, uh, having both urban and rural uh, sections. What, as a state lawmaker, can your focus be to, um, it's almost a cliche, but to bridge the urban-rural divide? Well, I agree with that. Uh, that is a cliche, and uh, I don't think it really serves Oregon very well. Um, we do have to recognize that there's different needs and different uh, uh, 
different resources available and, and, and different cultures uh, also between urban and rural. But I really think uh, or, or, Oregon, uh, you know, as we see it really does a good job of reaching out to rural. We, we uh, provide a lot of resources to rural Oregon and uh, it's not always just about uh, Portland uh, in the legislature. We have great representation outside of that metro area. And, uh, you know, we, uh, when we're doing investments in infrastructure, I think you'll find our infrastructure investments because I co-chair one of those committees on, on uh, providing the bonding for infrastructure goes around the state. And uh, we, we really do try to make sure that the whole state has, has resources available to it. And oftentimes we find that the state has to help backfill many of these counties who don't have the resources they need. And so, and that's largely in, in some of those rural counties uh, where the state does step in and help, help out. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask that we uh, give Timothy Aldo uh, some time to respond to this question. <laughs> uh, you know, it, that's a great question. The, the divide between urban and rural, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with uh, my respective uh, opponent here. Uh, there's a huge uh, change between the urban and rural when you leave Eugene and you get out into the, uh, the outer parts of Lane County. Um, really, you know, people in uh, no tie have no, no ties with uh, downtown Eugene, uh, South Eugene district. Uh, a lot of them, they, they just have no concept of it. Uh, and I think that is openly showed in the last uh, few years in the legislature, the walkouts uh, protecting um, the urban and the rural divide uh, over, uh, you know, things that just has no concept outside of, of that. Um, uh, part of that uh, fix may be relooking at that independent redistricting um, so that we can take the lawmakers out of drawing uh, gerrymandered districts. Thank you. And this next question will start with uh, Timothy Aldall. Um, and Timothy, you mentioned, uh, you alluded to the, the walkouts that happened in the state legislature with uh, Republicans in both the House and the Senate. And of course, we should note Democrats um, did a, a form of that uh, 20 years ago. Um, without getting into necessarily the issues that prompted that specific either of those walkouts specifically, do you think that's just simply the one of the, the acceptable tools in the toolbox at the legislature? Are there structural changes to how the legislature is set up and functions that uh, you th think should be done to address that? Uh, unfortunately, when there's so much of a divide and a supermajority that dictates uh, both uh, levels of the legislature, uh, it's a parliamentary technique. Uh, as you said, it's been used by the Democrats in the past and the Republicans uh, as of recent. Um, it's, uh, it's par for the course and it's a way to keep uh, the supermajority from running completely over um, the, the rural areas and uh, overuse of uh, democratic process. Paul Holvey? Yeah, could you repeat that question, please? Uh, sure. Um, in short, uh, there were walkouts in the state legislature, most recently by Republicans in the House and Senate. Um, and I did mention that Democrats uh, done a form of that 20 years ago, uh, before your time in the legislature. Uh, is that sort of one of the acceptable tools in the, the toolbox, uh, politically speaking, at the legislature? Or do you think there should be structural changes to how the legislature operates? Well, I don't think there technically needs to be structural changes, uh, although I would be in favor of uh, uh, reducing the super uh, majority requirements, the quorum rules. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't believe it is a legitimate tool, whether it was a Democrat that used it 20 years ago or the Republicans in February and then in, and in 2019. Because in, uh, in that sense, the minority uh, says the minority of legislators had, becomes more powerful uh, by saying we are going to ignore our constitutional oath of office, our obligation under the Constitution, and ignore the democratic process and not accept 
uh, a vote of the majority. And, you know, that's a fundamental democratic principle. I believe that uh, people who walk out are violating their constitutional oath of office. And uh, I think that was laid out in, in the February session as well. And it's, it's just one of those things. If we don't agree with you, then we're going to go home and we're not going to play. Uh, we're not going to allow anything constructive to happen. We're, we will shut down government. And essentially, that's uh, what the, the, uh, the problem that has come forward, whether it's because we disagree about climate change and uh, its existence or not, uh, people have a right to vote and uh, represent their districts. And it should not be taken away by a small group of people who, uh, because of a supermajority rec quorum requirement, uh, can shut down the whole system. I don't believe that's democracy. Once again, we're listening to the candidates for House District 8 in the Oregon uh, legislature, Democrat Paul Holvey and Republican uh, Timothy Aldo. We have time for one or two more questions before we move on to closing statements. Uh, this question will first go to Paul. Uh, wildfires struck uh, many places across Oregon, particularly in Western Oregon uh, last month. And one element of that is uh, quite a lot of housing was destroyed, including in some areas of, of low income communities. Uh, how do you think the state should address the shortage of housing, uh, not just in areas hit by wildfires, but uh, in any community that has affordable housing needs? Well, I think uh, affordable housing has uh, really been a huge focus of the legislature for uh, several sessions now. We have continued to use bonds to uh, support affordable housing projects and to help people with housing assistance. And uh, we need to continue to do that. Uh, one, of the, one of the keys uh, to this whole problem is is you know people a lot of people don't make enough money to pay rent or to even own a home and so uh, you know those those economic stresses of of people's wages not keeping up with the cost of living uh, over the last 30 40 years has caused some of these structural problems with with folks being able to afford a, a home a place to live and uh, we really need to keep focused on that and uh, do as much as we can to make sure that we have a, a strong economy where people have, are making enough money to participate in it. Uh, that, that's really key. And we will have to continue to invest in, in affordable uh, housing uh, while, whilst a, a good part of our workforce cannot afford housing. Uh, it's, a, it's a big issue. We've been putting hundreds of millions of dollars into that at the state level, recognizing the severity of homelessness that we have and, uh, you know, people just having a hard time making ends meet. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you. We need to continue to support, support uh, low-income housing. Thank you, uh, Paul. And Timothy Aldall. So the, the question was almost multi-phased uh, with that, uh, the wildfires out there in low-income areas and the rural areas. Um, I, uh, my family has property in Blue River. Uh, I grew up there until the age of five. Uh, that place isn't there anymore. Um, Blue River is effectively gone. Um, what the legislature has done in the past uh, can't even can't even start with this one. Uh, those in Blue River with the, the loss of the watershed and uh, ability to rebuild out there, just it, it, that community may never recover. Um, but uh, the low income housing, uh, yes, we do need some low income housing and then we need uh, money in the legislature dedicated to upkeep that low income housing. It's one thing to build these uh, multifamily units. Uh, it's another thing to uh, make sure that they're maintained so they don't turn into uh, uh, desolate places. Uh, we want uh, our low income people within our communities to be able to afford these houses and a strong community uh, once we open back up, free business, uh, free commerce, uh, we can actually afford once they get back to work. Come now for, uh, to the time for our closing statements. And uh, we'll start our closing statements of up to two minutes each uh, with Paul Holby. 
Well, thank you. I'm uh, again running for state representative, House District 8, here in the great state of Oregon and uh, representing a, a great part of the state. Uh, I believe I've, I fit this district very well. I'm, I get around this di district. I listen to uh, my constituents and I am uh, always in the legislature working very hard on policies, uh, you know, where, whether it's energy storage and, and solar energy or whether it's education and trying to make sure uh, we have the investments in our K-12 and university systems or just infrastructure investments. You know, these are really important things the state uh, needs to do. We have a, a lot of work uh, always to do and uh, it becomes more and more challenging in these times to make sure that our investments and our resources are delivering the services that Oregonians need, especially when our budgets are being eaten up by COVID response and now wildfire. We do not have the adequate resources to handle all of this. And we need to continue to focus on strategically investing uh, in, in those services and our economy. Um, so I really appreciate uh, uh, again, the time that uh, the League of Women Voters and uh, City Club have put into this to give us an opportunity to uh, have people listen to us. So thank you very much. I appreciate the vote. Thank you. And uh, Timothy Aldall with your closing statement. Again, my name is Timothy Aldall. I'm running for House District 8. Uh, I live, I work, I grew up in this district. Uh, I work daily with the uh, disenfranchised, uh, the low income, uh, the elderly within the community, and, and I know what the challenges are out there. Uh, my run is not only for the rural area that I live in, but also every citizen that is in District 8. Um, I just want to thank uh, the City Club of Eugene and uh, the League of uh, Women Voters for this, and uh, I appreciate your vote. Okay. Timothy Aldall and Paul Holvey, uh, candidates for the Oregon Legislature, House District 8. Thank you both uh, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Chris Lehman, and you're listening to a conversation between two candidates for House District 11 in the Oregon legislature. Uh, incumbent uh, Marty Wilde is a Democrat, and Republican uh, Katie Bosshart Glasser uh, is also running for this office. We're going to start with opening statements of up to two minutes each, and then we'll move to a series of questions where the candidates will have about a minute to respond, and then we'll leave time for uh, closing statements at the end. Uh, so for our first opening statement, uh, we will go to Marty, Marty Wilty. Thank you, Chris, the City Club for the opportunity to speak today. You know, my favorite part of running for office for the first time in 2018 was meeting so many of you on your doorsteps. I knocked on, personally, 11,500 doors, and my campaign volunteers knocked on another 20,000. And after I won that race, I kept on knocking in between sessions to catch up with you. You shared your priorities, your concerns, and the vision of the world that you want for our children. Across party lines that you told me your priorities were education, healthcare, and housing. And since it's not safe to go door to door this time through, We've made 60,000 phone calls so far in this campaign, and we'll keep calling through election day. But it's not really about campaigning. It's about checking in with people to help them with everything that's going on, with COVID, with unemployment, and with the fires. Our society has so many challenges, and we're getting people through the hard times, because that's the job that you want me to do. Although I've spoken to many of you before, let me briefly introduce myself that I haven't met to those I haven't met yet. I was literally born a duck on the University of Oregon campus, and my parents pretty quickly moved out to Blatchley to get out of the field burning smoke and try farming. They didn't have much money, and that got worse when my parents divorced. But people helped me through, whether it was personally with hand-me-down clothes, or voters when they helped with food stamps, with public health clinics, and education. And those helped me succeed. And when I graduated, I wanted to pay that forward. I've done that through 26 years of military service, active and reserve. 
I've fought forest fires in Oregon, up by Oak Ridge. I've shut down a coal plant in Alaska. I've helped hunt down war criminals in Bosnia. And I've defended human rights in the Middle East and Afghanistan. But when I got back from Afghanistan, I wanted to do more to rebuild at home because I saw those opportunities, that American dream wasn't there for kids today like it was for me. So I answered the call to serve my state in the legislature in 2018, and I got to be a part of some amazing things in my first terms. $1 billion a year more for pre-K through grade 12 schools, fixing a 30-year problem, protection from unjust eviction for one and a half million renters, and providing health care for one million of our low-income neighbors, the Oregon Health Plan. I'm running again because there are still so many things to do to help people in my district. And that starts with listening as we've done on so many calls. And it also starts with listening to people across the aisle. I'm a founding member of the Independent Caucus and we're working across party lines to get things done. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Marty. And for her opening statement, Katie Bossart Glasser. Thank you for allowing me to participate in this forum today. My name is Katie Bossart Glasser and I am a farmer with my husband on our family's 125 year old farm. Like our great great grandparents, every decision we make is to ensure continued sustainability and to keep our communities protected and healthy. Looking at my life now, you might think I've always had it easy, but that isn't true. My family was very poor starting out. When my mom was pregnant with me and my dad was long haul trucking, there was one night our house was so cold that our toilet bowl water froze. We survived because of the generosity of our family, friends, church, and community. After high school, I tried college and ended up going the trade school route. I have been an employee and a business owner. I have lived paycheck to paycheck and sometimes not having enough money at the end of the month. I've also lived without health, without health insurance because I couldn't afford it, but didn't qualify for the Oregon Health Plan. I say this all to let you know that I have lived under a lot of different circumstances and understand what many in our community go through. Our district is beautifully diverse. I believe that deep down all of us want similar things. We want to provide for ourselves and for our family, feel a purpose in life, and to try to make our world a better place for our future generations. I believe I am the best choice to be the next state representative for HD 11 because of my varied life experiences, along with working as a legislative aide in 2019. I am running to serve my community as a thank you for all they did when my family needed them. I have the skills and the passion to make sure all voices and opinions are heard in our beautiful district. I truly believe the only way to find solutions that will work for all of us is if everyone is brought to the table. That has been missing in this district. I will be a representative for all, working toward common sense legislation that is balanced by life experience shared by so many in this district. I will bring integrity and trust back to the Capitol. I hope you will choose me to be your next state representative. Thank you. We'll next proceed to a series of questions and I'll remind our two candidates that uh, please keep your responses to about a, a minute uh, in length so we can get to as many topics as possible during the allotted time. I will address the same question to both of you. Um, if the second person answering needs me to repeat the question, please say so. Otherwise, I'll just toss it over to the next person. So, uh, and we will alternate. I'll start with the first question for Katie. Uh, Katie, we're about seven months into the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, case counts in Oregon are on the rise again after rising and falling uh, various points over the course of the summer. The legislature has already taken uh, several actions to address the uh, fallout from this pandemic. And I was wondering if you think there are additional actions the legislature needs to take at this time. And if so, uh, what would those be? Yeah, thanks for the question. You know, I I get asked this uh, questions like this a lot, and uh, I first like to start off by saying that I have a lot of grace for people that were trying to make decisions at the beginning because it was so new and we didn't know what was happening. We didn't know we we didn't know what to expect. Uh, lately, I have a lot of questions. Uh, it's what is the end game? Uh, the goal keeps moving. Um, the governor is never really completely clear, and I don't feel that uh, many of our elected officials are holding her accountable either. I think our economy is struggling, and fortunately, seeing the numbers, it's not doing as bad as what some people have thought, but I mean, some of our businesses are destroyed and will never come back. I worry about the mental health of people and our single moms and gig workers. Um, and so I think it is time to safely and responsibly uh, open our economy back up. And I think that uh, our elected officials need to push for that. Thank you. Uh, Marty? 
Thank you for the question. Uh, it's the same things that people tell me in general they want, education, healthcare, and housing. When it comes to healthcare, we, a, a million of the one point, or the four, a million of the 4.3 million Oregonians we have are covered by the Oregon Health Plan. That's because we voted for the taxes that support them. And we need the voters now to vote for Measure 108 to continue that, because that's a critical piece of the response, is making sure that people um, stay healthy. Um, when it comes to education, we're seeing the challenges with online schooling, and I think we need to keep pushing at that until it's time to, you know, until it's safe to get our kids back to school, which will be soon. We're working on it, uh, a vaccine, and as soon as we get that out, we're going to have kids start coming back to school. Um, and then uh, when it comes to housing, um, we see the, the real needs here, and we're facing a cliff at the end of the year. I do expect that the federal government will pass another stimulus package, and my first priority when we have money for that is to make sure that we keep people in their housing. Uh, we need to fully fund our rental housing assistance for all of those in need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next question will start uh, by asking Marty. Um, this summer, racial justice protests were, uh, uh, were common in many parts of Oregon in both large cities and in rural communities. The legislature met in special session earlier in the year and addressed uh, some of the concerns over the justice system and law enforcement. I was wondering if you think there are additional steps that could be taken at this time. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we passed seven bills on uh, law enforcement reform and making sure that we keep our police close to the communities they're policing. But we do need to go further upstream. I think uh, I read in the paper lately, there was an op-ed and it said, when we don't take care of social problems, they become law enforcement problems. So this morning I met for an hour and a half with um, the local members of the local police union talking about what we can do to resource the services that help them. And that's not just cahoots, it's, it's housing, it's basic shelter. It's uh, mental health services. And those are all things that we need to do to help them do a good job. Um, of course, there is an element of accountability. As I say, um, you know, the people in my district don't help the hate the police, but they want them to do better. And we need to help them with that. And part of that is holding people accountable. Uh, I think there's been some unfair demonization of police unions. Uh, one thing we saw in, in the context of teachers was unionized teaching workforce actually hold their members accountable at higher rates than non-union ones. So let's remember that their officers are mostly out there doing a great job for us and we need to do what we can to support them and give them the resources they need. Um, and we also need to make sure that we held those accountable who aren't doing a good job. And I think that includes members of, of the supervisory chain who make poor decisions about uh, how to handle peaceful protests. Thank you, Marty. Uh, Katie? Yeah, so I have actually spent a lot of time talking with my uh, BIPOC friends, and I think this is the time that we need to listen, and it's really clear that there's a lot of hurt, and there has been injustices happening. Uh, when it comes to the police side of things, I as well have been talking to uh, different law enforcement officers, chief of polices, uh, union people, and uh, you know, one thing I do want to say is and want to point out is our, some of our police force are decades ahead of other areas in the country. And I think it does us a disservice when we don't uh, acknowledge that, especially the Eugene police. Uh, they have done many things, even without uh, people uh, protesting or the uh, legislator forcing them to. Uh, they were the first uh, one of the first in the nation to do the body cameras. And so I, I think that we are on a good path. I think we can always do better and we should, and we should be pushing for that and, and um, pushing for accountability. But uh, I believe that we need to make sure that our police force is fully funded so that they can have the, the best training and education that they need. And so that they can have programs as well like Kahoot that can partner with them um, to be able to best serve our community. Thank you. And Katie, we'll go back to you first for this next question. Uh, House District 11 is a lot like the, uh, the state of Oregon. There are some urban areas, there are some small towns, and then there's some rural uh, areas, agriculture, uh, timber, what, what have you. Um, there's a lot of talk in Oregon about the urban-rural divide, whether that's a, a myth or a real thing is subject to your opinion, of course. But uh, given that there are some differences between urban and rural areas in Oregon, I wonder what you think the legislature's role should be in attempting to bridge whatever divide there might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do uh, hear this and people ask me what, 
can I can I understand uh, what people are dealing with in uh, uh, South Eugene when I'm living out in the country as a farmer and and I go back to again that I really do believe that we ultimately want the same things. We might have different ideas on how to get there, but ultimately we want to live good lives. We want to be happy. We want to be passionate about things. We want to be able to provide for ourselves and our family. And I think uh, there have been certain uh, regulations, legislations maybe that have um, made us butt heads against each other. And so again, I want to be somebody who comes in and brings people together and says, listen, we can, this can all work out and we can work together so that we all feel good about it. We don't have to be against each other. I think the biggest problem is we have uh, misunderstandings and just don't understand each other as much as we used to. So I, I want to be someone who brings people together by building relationships and having conversations. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Marty? Well, of course, I grew up in rural Oregon, and now I live in town, so I have the personal perspective of, of uh, both of them. And I also hold town halls and talk with people across the district every day. Um, I would say institutionally, um, talking with representatives who represent uh, exclusively rural constituents, uh, I'm a, I, I founded the Independent Party of Oregon Caucus. Um, uh, we, those of us who applied for it got it, and one of the things we said we would do is found it, and then a caucus where we could have these conversations, these bipartisan conversations across the urban rural divide, across um, you know the Democratic Republican divide and so many others. It's really been a, a fabulous success. Uh, in our first two meetings, at both times we had 17 legislators attend, uh, Democrats and Republicans, representatives and senators. So we're really trying to walk the walk and um, you know have these conversations about how we can get better answers for everyone. Thank you. And uh, once again, we're listening to a conversation between two candidates for House District 11 in the Oregon legislature, Republican Katie Bossart Glasser and Democrat Marty Wilde. Our next question will first go to Marty. Um, in the past couple of legislative sessions, Republicans in both the, the House and the Senate have uh, walked out, uh, left the legislature, uh, denying majority Democrats a quorum. It should be mentioned that Democrats have used this tactic in the past 20 years ago, uh, before you, uh, Marty Wilde, were in the legislature. Do you think there are any structural changes to how the legislature operates that need to happen to address this? Or is this uh, sort of an expected tool in the political toolbox that can uh, be, be wielded going forward? I think we do need to take care of it. I think at the end of the day, it's a constitutional fix on the quorum. So that does need to go to the voters. Um, but in the interim, I've seen a lot of misbehavior. I mean, I saw people who swore an oath to come to work and abide by the constitution. And then their only constitutional duty as legislators is to vote. So they violated their oath and left the state. And then they paid for the expenses through campaign donations from donors. Uh, those are terrible problems. Um, again, the final fix will have to be with the voters, but I've got a bill that will uh, impose financial penalties and prohibit the use of, of um, campaign funds for those types of expenses. Um, I think that is just the job we signed up to do. I don't think we were elected, I think we were elected to take hard votes. And if you can't do that, you should resign, not uh, run away from the state. So I feel very strongly on that. That being said, I think it's also important that we leave the door open to conversation, and that's why I'm a founding member of the IPO caucus, the independent caucus, where we have these discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Katie? Yeah, so I would start out by saying that I don't believe that they broke their oath, considering that it is a tool that is available to all representatives representatives that uh, if you decide to walk out like the Democrats did at one point, um, it's not breaking an oath. I, I think that having walkouts the last two sessions shows how broken our government really is, how divided we are. And I think that um, it's a resource that needs to be made available. And I uh, also think that it is the job of the majority party to make sure that the minority voices are being heard uh, so that there can be bipartisan approaches uh, in, in solving problems in Salem. Do I, do I like that the Republicans had to walk out twice? No, I don't. Uh, this last time during the two 
2020 short session, uh, you know, that may not have had to happen if the Senate president wouldn't have started the first game when he removed Senator Betsy Johnson from her committee because she was going to vote the bill down and so it would have never made it to the floor. And that's something that most people don't know about. And so that walkout wouldn't have even happened if that first process would have been left alone and allowed to happen. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions uh, in today's conversation. Uh, this next question I'll first address to uh, Katie. And the question is about affordable housing. It's an ongoing issue in Oregon and made uh, even more so by the recent wildfires, which destroyed uh, hundreds, if not thousands of homes in many parts of Oregon, including uh, here locally. I was wondering, uh, either in reaction to the wildfires or just in generally, what role, what steps the legislature can take to address the affordable housing issue? Yes, I, I do think that this is a major issue that we have and it um, affects different areas in our society. And I do think it plays into our homelessness issue. Um, I personally think that this is going to be a hot topic in our next uh, long session. And uh, part of what I think needs to happen is we need to lift some of the regulations and some of the uh, permitting processes, things like that, that are in the way of being able to build affordable housing. And uh, especially lifting some of those regulations and permitting processes um, for our, our victims that their houses and uh, buildings were destroyed in the fire. We need to make sure that they can get back up on their feet. And I also think that we need to take a hard look at some of our land use laws. Um, our, our population is growing and we have not been able to keep up. And so I think that we need real legislation to have real real solutions. And um, the one thing I do want to point out is I know uh, one of the only votes that will be uh, Representative Wilde voted against his own party uh, was when it would uh, open up for um, more housing to be able to go into housing area development areas. And he did not vote for that. And I find it interesting because it, it really could have opened up opportunities for people to build more houses and more affordable houses. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Marty? Well, perhaps my opponent will recall that the University of Oregon is in our district, and when the university decides they want 2,000 more students, it's devastating to the communities around it. I voted against that bill because it would have required upzoning on every single lot, whereas I voted for House Bill 2001, which holds cities and counties responsible for building the housing they need in the future. That is what this district wanted. Um, I would say uh, regarding the fires in particular, uh, I've, I'm drafting a bill that will uh, allow longer time for rebuilding some of those structures. Some of them would have to be rebuilt in a year. Frankly, the timelines we're seeing for FEMA for even clearing the debris off those sites is longer than a year in some cases. So it's important to give them that time. And I think, you know, uh, I think it's important that we look at our, our building code and our insurance code to make sure that we are building fire resistant uh, places, rebuilding fire resistant places with defensible space so that we don't simply lose them again. And I think that's something the state can help with. I would note, uh, in addition to protecting housing by allowing renters to, uh, for giving renters protection against rent shocks and unjust eviction, we also passed the largest amount for low income uh, housing in, um, in state history. Uh, those funds in our district go, are going to at least three projects that I know of, one by Dev Northwest, uh, one in Harrisburg, and um, one in, another one in Eugene as well. So uh, we're starting to see results from that, and there's a lot more work to do. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question, but I'll ask you to, to perhaps keep your responses uh, on the, the shorter side, uh, 30 seconds or so. Uh, Oregon pioneered the uh, vote by mail uh, system of doing elections uh, more than 20 years ago. How confident are you heading into this year's election that Oregon's vote by mail system is uh, secure and uh, effective? Marty. Uh, I am 100% confident in the system that has worked for over uh, 25 years now, I believe. Um, I would also say I've been working across party lines through the independent caucus um, with officials, uh, with people in the other party to make sure that we extend the deadline uh, or the Secretary of State extends the deadline for receipt of ballots for those places in which there have been fire damage and the mail may be delayed. Thank you, Marty. Uh, Katie? Yeah, I actually, I have to agree with this. You know, it's, we've already had vote by mail for, like you said, 20 or more years. And I, uh, I think systems always need to uh, make sure that there's checks and balances and make sure that it's uh, 
uh, an honest system, but overall, I think that it is a good system. And, and personally, I am at least at this point not worried about our mail-in ballot system. Thank you. Um, I'm Chris Lehman, and once again, we're listening to a discussion between the two candidates in House District 11, uh, Marty Wilde and Katie Bossart Glasser. We have time for closing statements of about two minutes each. And uh, to begin with, we'll turn to Katie Bossart Glasser. Thank you. We need a change in Oregon and we need a new direction. I hate party politics just as much as the next person, but it's what we've had for the last 30 years. My opponent voted with his own party 98% of the time. Our district is far too diverse to vote 98% of the time with your own party. What we need is a representative that will build relationships and, and work across party lines. My opponent has not done that. We need a representative that will fight for all voices of the district, not just the ones they prefer. Someone who will stand for integrity, someone who we can trust again. My opponent has not been able to accomplish this. It said, uh, the first thing you do after getting elected is to work at getting reelected. My promise to you is that I will do this job for as long as you need me to. I will work at building trust and bringing people together. We don't need more division. A lot has happened this year, shutdowns, social distancing, and fire devastation. This year has also brought to light the areas that needed it. Bottom line, people are hurting and we need to do better. Everyone deserves to feel safe and heard. Our representative needs to be someone who will take real action, not make excuses or use talking points. As I speak with voters from across the district, they all want safe communities, quality education, healthcare choice, real solutions for mental health, and housing affordability. I am committed to working on these important issues, not fo focusing on ideological special interests. I'm Katie Bossart Glasser, and I hope to earn your vote on November 3rd so I can unite our district once more and fight for your voice to be heard. Thank you. And for your closing statement, uh, Marty Wilde. Thank you, Chris. Helping our neighbors in need, education, healthcare, and housing. These are still the bipartisan priorities we share. When I joined the infantry in 1994, they taught me to never leave anyone behind. And that's why I still serve. That begins with responding to the twin disaster of COVID and the fires, making sure no one is left behind. That's why I went to the relief sites to help and make sure everybody was getting what they needed and why I went up to the fires to survey the damage and recognize the firefighter heroes there. Getting resources to those who need them especially in our rural communities that were hit so hard is critical. Housing those who have had their homes destroyed, uh, both now in the interim and helping them rebuild. And we need to resource production, both physically and economically. When it comes to education, we're still, there's still so much to do. We need universally accessible childcare. We're seeing the failures of our current system. I would advocate we adopt the military model, which has strong centralized system and uh, an entrepreneurial system in people's homes where the government is, uh, helps, it doesn't hurt. Uh, we need to maintain our funding for pre-K through grade 12, and we need to fully fund need-based financial aid so college and career training are accessible for everyone. When it comes to healthcare, we need to keep our COVID rates low and begin distributing the vaccine as soon as it's approved. We need to pass the tobacco taxes on November 3rd to pay for the Oregon health plan and keep our kids off of nicotine. We need to provide affordable options for middle-income Oregonians who are the ones suffering most. And we need to provide a plan for single-payer health system, a road to the future for our healthcare system. Finally, when it comes to housing, we need to help people get through the COVID rent crisis looming at the end of this year. We need to shelter those living on the streets. 2,000 of our neighbors in Eugene will sleep on the streets tonight. And we need, to building the, we need to build the housing we need for tomorrow so our kids can afford to live in the neighborhoods that they grew up in. These are the issues that you've told me you care about, and they're the ones I want to work on in a second term. Thank you to the City Club of Eugene for the opportunity to speak today, and please vote on November 3rd. Thank you. Democrat Marty Wilde and Republican Katie Bossart Glasser, thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. This has been our October 9th, 2020 program. Oregon House Districts 8 and 11 candidate forum. Before we proceed, I'd like to recognize some gold sponsors, Gatos, Churnside, and Balthrop, PC, 
Evans, Elder, Brown, and Subert. Homes for Good. It is our expectation to have the taped conversations available by Fridays at noon. We want to thank you all for supporting us during this difficult time. Before we thank our speakers today, there are a few quick announcements. Thanks to our in-kind sponsors, KRVM 91.9 Radio, PAC Info and Simplified Computing, LLC, Dot Dotson's Photography, and Network Charter School. And a special thank you to public radio station KLCC 89.7 for airing City Club programs on Mondays at 7 p.m. And thank you to Community Television of Lane County Cable Channel 29 for televising recent City Club programs. Next week, the City Club of Eugene partners with the League of Women Voters, the Springfield City Club, and KLCC to host a program on the United States House of Representatives race for Oregon's 4th Congressional District. We will welcome Congressman Peter DeFazio, Daniel Hofe, and Alex Scarlatos. This event will be moderated by KLCC reporter Brian Bull. Potential questions for the candidates may be submitted by, by the public until Monday, October 12th, and the program's moderator will select those that will be asked. Please send questions to administrator at cityclubofeugene.org. That's administrator at cityclubofeugene.org. Please join us again on October 16. More details and information about future programs can be found online at the City Club's website, cityclubofeugene.org. Now, I would like to thank today's speakers for a great program. Timothy Aldall, Paul Holby, Holvey, Katie Bossard Glazer, and Marty Wildey. Thank you very much. This concludes today's program. Be well and stay safe.